Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thanks for joining us online and in person at Southeast Church of the Nazarene. Hope you all had a good week. Our opening scripture comes from the New Testament, John chapter 5, verses 24 to 30. That's John 5, 24 through 30, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. I assure you, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death into life. And I assure you that the time is coming. In fact, it is here when the dead will hear my voice, the voice of the Son of God, and those who listen will live. The Father has life in, in himself, and he has granted his Son to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge all mankind because he is the Son of Man. Don't be so surprised. Indeed, the time is coming when all the dead in their graves will hear the voice of God's Son, and they will rise again. Those who have done good will rise to eternal life, and those who have con continued in evil will rise to judgment. But I do nothing without consulting the Father. I judge as I am told, and my judgment is, is absolutely just because it is according to the will of God who sent me. It is not merely my own. Let us pray. Uh, thank you, Lord, for another day. I ask and pray that you open your word to us, Lord, as we hear it uh, through the scripture, Lord, and through song. And I ask and pray that you just continue to be with us, Lord, as we uh, continue in the faith, Lord. I ask us and pray it all in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning, we would invite you to stand and worship with us if you are willing and able as we sing a new name written down in glory. I was once a sinner, but I came pardoned to receive from my Lord. This was freely given, and I found that He always kept His word. Sing their story A sinner has come home Oh, there's a new name Written down in glory And it's mine Oh, yes, it's mine And the white-robed angels Sing the story A sinner has come home For there's a new name Oh, there's a new name written down in glory. 
of angels tell the story. A sinner has come home. Oh, there's a new day written down in glory. And it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. With my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven. Nevermore to go. of the Lord together today and also thankful for those of you who are joining on Facebook Live and I know we'll have some watching on YouTube later. Uh, we want to go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Our psalm for today is Psalm number eight and so go ahead and turn with me to Psalm number eight and in just a moment we'll pray that aloud and have our time of prayer. Uh, but as we, as we locate Psalm eight, I uh, want to take some time for praises and pains. And so any special praises, prayer requests, pains that you would like to voice this morning. I want to thank the Lord for giving John Mark safe traveling mercies. He came out to go to a wedding this weekend and just thanking God for, for the time here for a minute, a quick minute. 
And um, also just um, thankful for God's continued uh, faithfulness, as Brother Smith is always saying, that um, yes. he has been with our family, and we continue to thank him, and he's continuing to be with his church and moving forward, and um, just give God all the glory. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? I'd like to give God thanks for, um, for uh, giving us a new day and Amen. for giving us um, well, uh, the strength to, um, to get up and do what's necessary to to do as well. Um, but in, in in my part particularly, um, give me the ability to uh, be there for my grandmother and all the um, And uh, I'm a little concerned right now because I'm not sure if my grandma's getting sick or not because I heard her coughing a little bit. So mm -hmm. just uh, praise God that that he has those healing hands to you touch her, so I pray that uh, he, he does so, and I know he will. Yeah. 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 Anyone else? I want to keep Dora and her father in prayer in particular, and also Brother Mario and his family, his grandson Alex in particular. Um, we want to remember Charlene in prayer today. Anyone else? Tony, I think I saw your hand. <clears throat> Um, I'd like to thank God for His love and grace and everything He's shown me and given me. And this church with all these people that love me and care and pray for me. Amen. Yeah. And for my kids. Yeah. And also for the same as the traveling. Yes, remember uh, Ron and Nancy and Christina visiting uh, Sister Nancy's sister. Uh, up in Northern California, so I want to keep them in prayer. Any yeah, other? Yes, right, right through Oregon Hill. Right through where you're from. Yep. All right, well, turn with me to Psalm 8, and I'm reading, praying the New International Version as my translation. If you have that translation, pray aloud with me. If you have a different translation, just follow along, and then feel free to pray out, and then we'll close with the Lord's Prayer together. So Psalm number 8. Let us begin. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him, you made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen. Let us continue to pray.
Mm -hmm. uh, who travels, they run, they dance, and mm -hmm. they pray. Mm -hmm. that you give them uh, traveling mm -hmm. Yes. And also, be with her sister. Yes. And yes. you know, uh, they should really be careful of that. Yes. 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 Yes, yes, thank and you. Be with him, continue to uh, meet all the needs that he has. Mm -hmm. you know that he has for him. Yes. And we trust you, trust him. Mm -hmm. uh, we we uh, pray for those who are not here. Mm -hmm. we'll take us, uh, Charlene, yes. uh, Brother Grace, Brother Smith, and his family. Mm -hmm. we pray for uh, uh, all the uh, Beto's uh, grandmother. Yes, sir. Uh, mm -hmm. We just pray. Uh, we know we can trust them in your hands. Yes. Because you care and you are able to do whatever this needs. Yes. And thank you for the Brother Tony. Thank you. Thank yes. you for him. Yes. We pray to him. Continue to be on him. Yes. Family and all the needs that he has. Yes. Father, uh, we just thank you for everyone that's here. Mm -hmm. We give you praise. Uh, yes, sir. We just thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Jesus' precious name. Dear Heavenly Father, I do just want to lift my voice in praise and worship to you, Lord, for truly how majestic is your name in yes, all the earth. Yes. Lord, we want to just uh, give you all the glory this morning and praise and the honor for all that you do. And thank you, God, that your hand is upon us. And Lord, you, you know us better than we know ourselves. And Lord, we don't understand, Lord, you do. And we thank you that you know. Um, about our present, but you also know about our future, Lord, and you know how to guide and direct our pathways, and we thank you, Father, that um, that you are a God who's in control, and Father, we just uh, thank you for each one that is here today, Lord, we yeah. pray a special blessing upon each and every one, and we pray especially for um, Brother Beto's grandmother, Lord, and, and her needs this morning, and how mm -hmm. his mom and Beto are trying to help, and yeah. Lord, we pray that you just be close to them, and and undertake for them and we pray for his grandmother's health lord that you touch her body this morning and we thank you for brother tony lord and for his testimony lord and how you've been so good to him and truly we can see lord how you have uh, brought him out from the deep fiery clay set his feet on a solid rock to stay lord and we just thank you that your hand has been upon him and lord we thank you that you continue to work in through him we ask that you touch his body today we pray that you help him lord with his health and Lord, we just uh, continue to lift up others, Lord. We think of those that are suffering from uh, illnesses or, or um, different uh, physical needs. We think of Sister Charlene. We ask that you'd be with her especially and ask that you would just touch her body and be with her uh, this week. Uh, Lord, you know her needs and we lift them up to you. We think of Brother Smith, Lord, this morning, Lord. We think of uh, Brother Mario, Lord, and we pray that you'd be close to him and meet his, his physical needs. And uh, others, Lord, that need a special touch from you. We think of little Ava this morning. And, Father, we pray your touch upon her. And for Kate and Callum, Lord, that you continue to touch with me upon them. And, uh, Lord, we pray for those who are uh, grieving the loss of loved ones this morning. Yeah. We think of Dora's father, Lord, and yeah. the loss in his life. And, Lord, we, are know, we know there are others, Lord, who have lost loved ones as well. We pray that you just be close to each and every one. And, and then we're thinking of Donna this morning, Sister Donna and her family. We pray that you would undertake for them, especially you know, the health needs that are represented yeah. there, Lord, with your brother. And uh, we just ask that you give grace and mercy and help and physical uh, strength where it's needed. And Lord, we just uh, pray that you would continue to be with uh, the ministries of this church. Lord, we're just so thankful for each one that is signed up and feels called to be a part of the church and, and the ministries here we're just so thankful that you are in our midst and father that you are answering your call to uh, to serve you in various ways in the church and lord be with those also who are um, struggling lord we think of those who are going through transitions or those who are struggling with addictions father we lift up lisa before you today <clears throat> we ask that you would be close to her I pray that you would be with uh, those who are incarcerated today, Lord. We just pray your special touch upon them, each and every one, Lord. Draw them close to yourself and help them to feel your presence with them. 
And then, Lord, we think of uh, Pastor Tony, Lord, as he's preaching his second Sunday at heaven. Yeah, yeah. Lord, we just ask that you continue to bless his ministry. Be with him and Sister Mynesha, Lord, that you just cover them with your presence. Lord, that you would go before them and uh, surround them with your love and care. And may you just, Lord, bring uh, fruitfulness to their their, their uh, ministry and their labor for you. And we think of uh, also of Pastor Chris and Rachel down at Living Water as well, that you would continue yeah. to touch them and meet their needs, we pray. And God, we just pray that your anointing would be upon this uh, service today, upon uh, Pastor Steve as he brings your word. We pray, Lord, that you'd speak to him and through him. Give him, Lord, the words to say. And help us, Lord, that we'd be obedient before you. And, and Lord, as we go tonight to the Mission Church, the San Diego Church has gathered together, Lord, we pray that that would be a time of um, hearing about the ministries around <clears throat> San Diego, and especially be with Pastor Steve as he gives your report on this church as well. And we thank you for Pastor D and his ministry here also. And, uh, we just pray that you would continue to guide and direct this church. And we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our gracious and holy Father in heaven, we are so blessed to be here today. We thank you for waking us this morning. We thank you for your call upon our lives, how you got us out of bed, how you brought us together. We thank you, Lord, for the breath that you give us today. And we pray, Lord, that you would empower us to use that breath for your honor and for your glory, that everything that we say, everything that we do, everything that we even think, that it would be all to your honor and to your glory. And you're our maker. You created us. We're not a mistake. We're not an accident. No matter how we got here, so many different circumstances of each of our births. And yet, Lord, we're here because of you. And then you're the one who brought us to life and you're the one who continues to give us breath. And we thank you for the purpose that you have given us, that we might reflect your goodness to one another, that we might reflect your your kindness, your graciousness, your faithfulness to each one that you bring into our lives. Help us to reflect you faithfully out into the world. And Lord, it's your name that is to be magnified, not ours. And you put us here that your name might be magnified, that you might be well known. And we thank you that you are so engaged in our lives. You're the one who's enthroned above, but, but you soup low and you're mindful of our every care, our every need. You invite us to cast our cares upon you because you care for us. You love us so much. And so we bring everything to you. We bring financial needs to you. We pray for those who are without work, those who are in need of better work. We pray, Lord, that you would provide and make a way for those who are un unable to work, Lord. Again, we ask that you would provide, that you would make a way. And Lord, as you have blessed us, help us to be help us to be gracious and help us to be generous with the many ways that you have blessed us, whether it's through finances, whether it's through time, whether it's through knowledge. The Lord, help us to be generous and to be gracious in all the different ways that you have blessed us. And then, Father, we thank you for the the privilege of coming together for being called into your church and we thank you for this church lord and the way that you have watched over us and cared for us you have brought us through so many different things thank you today that we're able to be back inside and just thank you for how you continue to care and you supply and we continue to look to you for guidance and direction in terms of what to do with the building and what changes to make and what to keep the same Lord, all these things, grant us your wisdom, we pray. And then, Lord, you're our healer. You're our great physician. We pray for those who have health needs today. We ask, Lord, that you'd be near to Charlene, that your hand would rest upon her. We pray that you would be near to Brother Mario and Brother Tony. Lord, let your hand rest upon each of them, their various health needs and concerns. Thank you for Brother Smith, Lord, and for his testimony of your faithfulness. And Lord, these are just a few. We pray that you would undertaken each and every life where there is a need for a fresh touch of health from you. And then, Lord, we ask that you be with all of our families today, our loved ones, and, Lord, those who aren't walking with you, we pray that you would draw them near to you and that they would come to know you as Savior and Lord and they'd walk closely to you. And we pray, Lord, that your light would shine through us. Help us, Lord, to be so faithful that, that it's undeniable who you are and the difference that you make, the life that you give. 
And Lord, you have given us life through Jesus, your son, our savior. Thank you for sending him to die on the cross for our sins. And we confess our sins and we confess our need for, for just the mercy and grace that comes to us through Christ Jesus. Cleanse us and purify us afresh today. Empower us to live faithful and true under the Lordship of Jesus. Help us, Lord, to hold nothing back, to live totally relinquished lives. And Lord, empower us to love as you have loved us, to be gracious as you have been gracious to us. And help us, Lord, to stick with each other, to bear with each other as you have stuck with us, as you have borne with us. Thank you for those that you have brought into our lives who encourage us and who hold us accountable and who teach us and laugh with us and cry with us. Lord, help us to be that kind of a person to someone else, that kind of a brother, that kind of a sister, to where you work through us to help someone know you better, help someone follow you more closely. And we pray, Father, for uh, our leadership. We pray that you would be near to our district leadership, be with Tom, keep your hand upon him. We know that he's been under a lot physically, and we ask, Lord, for your touch upon him and that you would bless this service tonight. And then, Father, we pray that you would be with all of our all of our leadership across the globe, whether it's at the local city level, whether it's state, whether it's international level. And then, Lord, we think of leaders in terms of politics, but also leaders in terms of corporations, just and, and, and media influencers. We pray, Lord, that leadership across the globe would be humble enough to seek you and to yes. seek your ways and that you would work through to accomplish your will, to accomplish your your grace. And then, Father, we pray for your church, wherever it's gathered today, certainly here on this corner, but also across the street, up the street, all parts of the globe, Lord. We pray for a fresh anointing of your spirit, that you do such a work within us, again, that it's undeniable, undeniable as to who you are, and that you are the God who saves, you're the God who redeems, you're the God who transforms, you are the God who enables us to live rightly and to live lovingly and graciously and holy lives. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, again, I'm just grateful to be here in the house of the Lord. Grateful to see each of you who are here today and those who are joining online. Uh, offering plates are there in the back with Brother Tony, and you're welcome to give uh, by placing it in the plate. You can also mail it in. You can also give online. Uh, at southeastnazsd.org. So just grateful for the many ways that you exercise faithful stewardship. And then uh, we do have some announcements. And so normally we would have Bible study tonight here at the church at six o'clock, but this is a special night. This is the night of the zone rally. And so we'll be gathering at the Mission Church of the Nazarene at six o'clock. And we'll hear, we'll hear from the pastors of the Nazarene churches in the San Diego area. Uh, don't worry, everyone's limited to three minutes each. And so afterwards, there'll be refreshments, cookies. Uh, it'll be a good time together. So you want to be at that. And uh, if you need directions, let me know. But that starts at 6 o'clock. And then Friday night, we will continue on with membership class. So the meal at 6 o'clock, membership class at 7 o'clock. And if you want to attend through Zoom, make sure that we have the, your Zoom information so we can get you notified of that. And then what else, Dan? Uh, breakfast, we had men's breakfast yesterday. So men's breakfast comes the first Saturday of the month and then women's breakfast is the last Saturday of the month. And so kind of put that on your calendar. And I believe those are the main announcements. Oh yeah, ministry signups, you can still do the ministry signups. Those are, uh, the sheets are back there on the table where Brother Tony's at. If you're feeling called to get involved, we would love to, to put you to work. And I think those are the announcements. Am I right? Any other announcements that you're thinking of? All right, we're good. So question for you today. Question is this. Name one thing that you would like to be able to renew instead of replace. 
Okay, like one thing in your life that you wish you could renew and that you wouldn't need to replace it. Okay, for example, I got a pair of old basketball shoes out there in the back of the car. They don't make that kind anymore. I wish I could just renew those because they really can't be replaced. Anyways, that's my one thing for the moment. Go ahead, talk about it. One thing that you wish you could renew instead of replace. to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, and we're going to start at verse 11. And here I am thinking about basketball shoes getting renewed. I thought about my knees getting renewed instead of replaced. And, and I hear some really profound stuff in terms of renewing relationships and, and just really impressive, the, the, the depth of renewal. And so turn with me to Revelation chapter 20. And we're going to start at verse 11, and we're going to read on through to 21.8. So Revelation chapter 20, beginning at verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire." Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making all things new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, 
it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your ministry to us already. Thank you for gathering us together. And we pray that as we come before your word, that you would speak afresh to us. Uh, give us ears that we might hear you, hearts to be receptive to you, minds to be obedient to you. Move in our midst today and accomplish your will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I mean, I am a little curious. I don't think I heard anybody mention this building as something you want to renew. Are you just wanting to replace it? I mean, it's crossed my mind, but we're not going there this morning. So, Revelation or Revelations? Revelation. Revelation. Very good. I heard someone call, I think, Pastor D on account of that the other night. I think I heard Pastor D let an S slip, and, uh, and I heard somebody catch him on it. And I think Pastor D was actually testing to see if somebody was listening, and they were. And so, just Revelation. Shun. So revelation is one revelation, and it's the revelation of Jesus Christ and his victory, that Jesus is the victorious one. And revelation, this revelation was given by God, received by John, passed on to the churches around A.D. 95. And during A.D. 95, in the context of the Roman Empire, the emperor's name was Domitian. And you know this by now. The emperor's name was Domitian, and Domitian was demanding that everybody across the empire worship him, that he claimed to be God, he claimed to be king of kings and lord of lords, and so if you were going to be a good citizen of the empire, it was important, it was necessary that you worship the emperor. And most of the Roman Empire had no problem with this. They had lots of gods, just like we have lots of taxes. And so one more God, one more tax, no big deal. But for Christians, Jesus is worthy of our worship and Jesus alone. And Jesus alone is Savior and Lord, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, no one else beside him. And so for Christians, this really presented a, a problem. And as Christians tried to live faithful to Christ, and as Domitian heard about it, there was persecution, there was threat. It was a dark, scary time. And Rome could come after you in different ways. They could come after your life. Antipas, one of the believers in John's churches, he was executed because of his faithful testimony to Jesus. Rome could come after you in terms of isolating you and removing you from society. And so John, the writer of Revelation, pastor of these churches, he had been taken and incarcerated in a prison camp, separated on an island from his people. So Rome could come at you that way. And Rome could also come at you financially making it so that you couldn't work, making it so that you couldn't do business with people, making it so that you couldn't put bread on the table for your family. And so Rome had different ways of trying to coerce you, seduce you into worshiping the emperor and compromising your faith in Christ Jesus. And so that you sell out to Christ in order to keep, quote unquote, alive in the empire. And John is receiving this revelation to give to his churches to let them know that Jesus is the victorious one. And that Jesus is the true king who is worthy of our worship. Yes. That Domitian may be making a lot of claims. Domitian may be making promises. He may be making threats. But Domitian is not worthy of our worship, not worthy of our lives. He is temporary and passing. But Christ is the one who gives us eternal life. And Christ is the one who is worthy of our lives and worthy of our worship. So, so John shares this revelation, receives it and shares it 
to help motivate his people in AD 95 to stay faithful at all costs. Now, we're getting near the end of this revelation. And I want to just kind of summarize just a couple things before we look at our passage today. And, and you remember, we're looking at this from how would this have been helpful to the people in AD 95? And if it helped them in AD 95 in their context, how will it be helpful to us today in 2024 in our context? And so that's kind of been the big question that we've been working with is not, you know, how does this play out? Where are we at in the revelation? How close are we to the end? That's not our question. Our question, how did this revelation help those believers in AD 95 in that tough, tough time? And if it helped them, maybe it will just help us the same way today in 2024. So that's the angle that we've been working from. Now, one thing I have really noticed is that there's a lot of parallels with Exodus. That remember our Old Testament story, the children of Israel in bondage down in Egypt and being worked ruthlessly, and God raises up Moses to deliver them. And Moses says, thus says the Lord, let my people go to worship me. And Pharaoh's response, who is the Lord that I should listen to him? It's my word that matters. I don't listen to anybody. What are you talking about, Moses? It's not about what the Lord says. It's about what I say. Now, does that remind you of anybody? I don't mean the person next to you. I mean, does that remind you of Domitian? Domitian is the one who thought that way, that it was his word that mattered. He was God of the Roman Empire. And whatever he signed that became reality. See the parallel. And, and, the, and, and, and the Lord responds, you know, through Moses, let my people go. And Pharaoh digs in deeper. And so finally what happens? We have the plagues. We have the 10 plagues, and those 10 plagues are designed to answer Pharaoh's question, who is the Lord that I should listen to him? And those 10 plagues are judgments on Pharaoh. They're judgments on the gods of Egypt. And they reveal that God is the one who is worthy of being listened to, not Pharaoh. And through those plagues, God liberates the Israelites from that bondage that they were in to Pharaoh. But, but that liberation isn't so that they can go do their own thing. That liberation is so that instead of being in bondage to Pharaoh, they fully belong to God and are able to listen to God and live in fellowship with God and with each other. And so the Lord, one day Moses was frustrated, like, God, you're not acting fast enough. What are you up to? And the Lord speaks his name to Moses and the Lord lets Moses know, here's what I'm doing. I'm going to let, let, I'm going to deliver my people and they will be my people and I will be their God and they will know me. And I'll bless them with a new life in the promised land. And so the plagues take place and then God brings them to Mount Sinai and God enters into covenant with the people. And so that he is their God and they are his people and, he, and they know what he has done for them. And then most people forget this, but I know you don't how Exodus ends. It doesn't end with release. It doesn't end with getting the Ten Commandments. It doesn't end with, you know, recovening after the golden calf. How does Exodus end? It ends with the building of the tabernacle. And if you look at the last paragraph of Exodus, God moves in and dwells among the people and his glory fills the tabernacle. See, God's goal wasn't just to get them out of Egypt. God's goal was to bring them to himself that he might dwell with them and that they would know him and he would know them. And together they would be, it would be like a new life in the garden. Okay, are you tracking? Are you seeing anything here? God's goal, what God is up to in the revelation is not just 
setting people free, his people delivering them from Rome, but it's about bringing people to himself to be their God and he will be, and they will be his people and God will actually come down from heaven and dwell with his people. Are, are you kind of seeing it? And so we have, these, we have these judgments across Revelation, three sets of seven. We got the seven seals. We had the seven trumpets. We had the seven bowls of wrath. But all of that is parallel to the plagues. And so think about the purpose of the plagues to answer the question, who is God who is truly worthy of worship? And to liberate the people, to bring them to God's self that he might give them a new life in the promised land and that he might dwell in their midst and they would know him. Same thing with these cycles of judgment. The purpose, yes, to liberate from this evil world, to bring judgment on this evil world and the gods of this world, the beasts of this world, but also so that God might gather the people to God's self and that God might dwell amongst us and that we would know God and God would know us. And just as God had a new life for the Israelites that he was waiting to give them in the promised land, and so God has new life for us in a new creation, a renewed creation. So I'm hoping that, you know, as we've been tracking through here, you've been kind of seeing a parallel with the story of Exodus and what's going on in this revelation. Uh, second thing that I'm hoping that you're picking up on uh, as we move through it is that basically all of this is is, is kind of to the nth degree. And so all of the visions that John is having, all of the, the language here, is, it's God is at work and God is answering the prayer that we pray every week, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, where? On earth as it is in heaven. So God's attention is what's going on on earth. And God's desire is for his glory to be displayed on the earth. God doesn't want just to rule in heaven. God wants to answer our prayers of his will, his kingdom coming to earth. And so Revelation is really about the answer to that prayer. And so we're, we're kind of seeing that as we go along. Okay, I think we're ready. I think we're ready to go ahead and begin to look at this. Maybe I need to say one more word, kind of preparation. W way back at the beginning of Revelation, we saw the letters to the churches and we saw this language to the one who overcomes. And typically to the one who overcomes is promised life. And there's some symbol of what that life is. And, and we talked about this a long time ago, but I just want to kind of recall it, that to overcome does not mean somehow you beat the charges against you. Okay, you were charged with being a Christian. And so to overcome means that you're going to stay faithful to Christ no matter the consequences. That's what overcoming is. And to the world, you look like a loser because you were foolish enough to hold fast to Christ that it cost you your life. You were foolish enough to hold fast to Christ that it costs you being isolated on, a, on an island in a prison camp. You were foolish enough to being faithful to Christ that you're out of work and you can't put bread on the table for your family and you're left to beg. That looks like the life of a loser. And John is saying, no, that's the life of someone who is victorious because you didn't compromise you didn't cave in. You didn't sell out to the emperor and the empire, but you stayed faithful to Christ at all cost. That's the overcomer. That's the one who is victorious. And John is writing to help his people be overcomers, to be victorious in the face of all that pressure to conform. And so how will this help us 
to stay faithful in our world that tries to seduce us, that tries to coerce us into making compromises with Christ. Okay, so Revelation 21. I'm sorry, Revelation 20, verse 11. What we have is a vision of a great white throne. And so just remember, you know, we've had the, the dragon is defeated and done. The beast and the false prophet defeated and done. So we're kind of at the end. Okay, and at the end, what John sees is this great white throne and one seated on it. Now, you got to remember, the last time we really talked about throne stuff was back in chapters four and five. And there he saw one seated on the throne above in heaven. And we also saw that the lamb was there at the center of the throne. And we saw the four living creatures around the throne worshiping. And we saw the 24 elders around the throne worshiping. So we've, we've seen this throne before. The throne that everybody talked about was the throne in Rome. And so once again, we have this contrast. We had it at the beginning of the book of Revelation. Now we have it at the end of Revelation. Which throne has your attention? And see, so John is caught up with this throne that's above and the 24 elders and the four living creatures worshiping the one upon the throne and the lamb, you know, there at the center of the throne, worthy of worship as well. But there's this throne in Rome that's making all kinds of demands and all kinds of promises and all kinds of claims. And it's like, which throne are you going to orient your life towards? Is that throne in Rome really going to be the center of your life? And you're going to kind of forget about the throne above and act and live as if it doesn't really exist? Or are you going to recognize that the throne above, that's the true throne, that's the throne that matters. And so you're going to live your life towards that throne rather than the throne in Rome. And in Revelation 4 and 5, the four living creatures, one had the face of a lion, the lion is the king of the jungle. One had the face of an ox, the king of the farm, domesticated animals. One had the face of a human, given dominion over all the living creatures. And one had the face of an eagle, king of the air. And these four living creatures representing all creation, they're not bowing down to Domitian. They're not concerned about the throne in Rome. They're worshiping the one enthroned above. And so we're kind of hit with the question we're hit with the question, who are you going to worship? Are you going to worship one who is really not worthy? Or are you going to worship the one whom all creation worship? Oh, and do you remember those four living creatures? What were they covered with? Eyes. Covered with eyes so that they could not be deceived. They were not going to be fooled by Domitian or anyone else. They knew that the one above is the one worthy of worship. And so that's picture number one of the throne. Picture number two, now we're at the end, and now there are books. And everyone is called before this throne. Man, have you been called into the office ever? You know, I'm called into the principal's office, called into the boss's office, called into, I mean, whatever office it is, have you been called? And that's kind of a scary thing because usually when you've been called into the office, it's because, some, you know, somebody's got something against you and they got it in writing. And can you imagine back there in AD 95, getting called in, called in to some throne of the emperor. You may not be called directly to Rome, but you know that the emperor had his judges across the empire. Can you imagine getting called in because somebody wrote you up as being Christian? See, I mean, that was a real threat. 
that you could get called in, that the books would be open, and there would be a charge against you for being Christian. You know, I kind of wonder if anybody could charge us for being Christian. You know, like, I don't know what they did in 8095 that made it so evident that they were Christian. I guess not worshiping the emperor, not showing up for that. But to live such a Christian life that people actually charge you for being Christian. Could we get charged for being Christian? I mean, that's kind of a challenge to think about. That we would live so faithful to Christ Jesus that people could actually write us up for being followers of Jesus. That's what was happening then. And the books would be open and you would be questioned about it. And yes, the charges are true. Then you would face consequences. You would live in fear of those books being opened and what that would cost you. And yet here, what we have is a throne above and books opened. And who's called? before this throne, all the dead. Everybody fetched from their graves, everybody fetched from their place of death if they didn't have a grave, but everybody called to count before God. And it did, you could not escape this calling. You know, I, I think of Sister Alex's bumper sticker. You know, I ran out of sick days, so I called in dead. And, and you would think if you called in dead, your boss isn't going to call you into the office like it's too late. Okay, but here you can't even call in dead. That the dead are fetched from their graves or fetched from the sea and they're called in and the books are open. But there's also a second book or a third or fourth book. There's this set of books and then there's this book over here. And this set of books, it has every person's name and all of their deeds. It's like somebody's been keeping track of you, keeping track of your attitudes, keeping track of your words, keeping track of your associates. Somebody's been keeping track of you. Okay, and I, would, I think they would get that because no doubt Rome kept book on everybody in the empire. Sometimes think somebody's keeping book on me when I see the stuff that comes across my phone. It's like, how did they know that? And it's like somebody's keeping book. Somebody, the books were open, every person's name, everybody fetched before this throne, no matter where you were at, and all of your deeds were written in those books. And then over here you have the book of life that just has a list of names. And... And the picture is that before the throne, the judge, the king, looks at your name and looks at what you've done, looks at your life, the deeds of your life. Anybody going to survive? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And every single person in those books is under condemnation for the rebellious deeds, attitudes, words, thoughts against God. But I can just see the judge, okay? Turning the page, finding you, finding your deeds, guilty. But let me look over here, book of life, moving through the names. And all of a sudden, there's your name in the book of life. Guilty in these books, under condemnation in these books, every deed done in these books. But over here, book of life, your name. And you receive life instead of condemnation because your name's in that book. Wow. How'd your name get in that book? 
the Lamb. The grace of God. That God sent His Son to die on the cross that we could be reconciled unto God and that we could be at peace with God and that we could have life. That we're in a grace relationship with God. And God acted and the Spirit moved and we confessed our sins and we repented of our ways and we received what we couldn't accomplish for ourselves, the gift of life through Jesus. And at that point, the song we sang this morning, there's a new name written down in glory. That at that point, our name isn't just in the books over here about everything that we've done wrong. At that point, our name is written in the book of life because of what God has done through the Lamb. And that we've owned our sin and confessed our sin and surrendered ourselves. And now we're at a place where we're receiving life graciously as a gift instead of the condemnation that we deserve. You kind of see what this does to the people that John is writing for? It gets their focus off of Rome and that throne and those books, and what Rome could do to you. And puts your focus on the throne that we need to be concerned about, and the books that we need to be concerned about. And it motivates us, wait a minute, the last thing I'm going to do, the thing God helped me to never do, is to be so concerned about those books that Rome has that I compromise my worship, my faith, my gratitude to Christ. And so I'm going to live by the throne above. And I'm not going to do anything to jeopardize my name being written in the book of life. Amen. That I'm going, to, I'm going to own my sins. I'm going to confess my sin. I'm going to repent from my sin. And by the grace of God, I'm going to stay faithful to the Lamb and not be deceived into compromising with this world. Look at the end, what happens here. The the last part of that vision. We'll pick it up at verse 14 of chapter 20. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. Did you get that? The end of death. The dragon was defeated and thrown into that lake. The dragon was done. The beast and the false prophet thrown into that lake. They were done. Eternal judgment. Death itself, a weapon against us, thrown into that lake of fire. Death is done. Verse 15, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. See, the world would try to tell us that how we live doesn't really matter. You just make whatever compromises you need to make in order to get by. But this vision of the throne above in the books is saying what we do matters. That it, what we do here in the time that we have matters eternally. And so we need to own our sins and confess our sins and repent from our sins and confess that Jesus is our Savior, that Jesus is our Lord. So that we don't just have the books but our names are in the book of life. And God help us to care for our family members and our neighbors and those that the Lord brings into our lives, that their names would be in the book of life and not just in the other books. So so that's kind of part one of today's message in terms of the, the vision of this throne. And it really raises the question, which throne am I more concerned about? And to realize, and which books am I more concerned about? Anyways, let's go on. So, so if you have your name in the book of life, then you get to participate in kind of the next vision. I'll pick it up at 21.1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And, and Joe, I don't know what to do with this, that there's no longer any sea. There is a river a river of life, 
and maybe you can be a river surfer, but I don't know what to do with that. I, I think the reason why there's no C, well, two things. One, the sea separated John from his people. And so I wonder that, I mean, that is one of the things that seas do, that oceans do. They tend to separate us from one another. And so I'm wondering if the reason why there's no sea is because the goal is that there's unity and community and that there's intimacy and that there's no, no longer these obstacles of separation between peoples. And so I suspect that that's part of why there's no sea. And John experienced that firsthand. The sea was used to separate him from his people. But in the new creation, there's not going to be that separation. There's going to be togetherness. And then I think maybe the, re the second reason why there is no sea is in their days, the sea was kind of seen as a symbol of chaos that brought disorder that could not be tamed. And, and so no sea is to kind of eliminate this chaos. By the way, if you, re if you remember, where did the beast come from? The beast came up out of the sea. And so it's kind of like God getting rid of a place to where beasts come from. And so I just kind of think about it that way. Uh, so anyways, no sea, this, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. There's that bride language. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He was seated on the throne, said, I am making everything new, all things new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. The, the, the picture I want you to try to get is that this is like the end of Exodus on steroids. The, the end of Exodus, God moving in and tabernacling with his people and his glory fills the tabernacle so that everybody has to kind of stand far off and Moses has to cover himself when he's in there. Okay, well, this is way beyond that. And that's what's up with the wedding language, the bride and the groom, that the church, we, the people of God are the bride and Jesus is the groom. And the whole focus is about togetherness. It's about union. It's about intimacy. It's about God coming to dwell with us, not just staying up in heaven, God coming to dwell with us so that we would know God and we would be his peoples and God would be our God. And there would be this, this unity, this communion. And, and again, I, I say it's on steroids because we already experienced this a little bit. They experienced it in Exodus. We experience it through Christ and Christ dwelling in our hearts. We experience it through the gift of the Holy Spirit so that the Spirit abides with us and we abide in the Spirit. We experience this a little bit already. Okay, but here, it's like going from being engaged to being married to where God comes and dwells in our midst. One location you know, for Vonda and I, it was no longer driving back and forth across town to each other's place. It's like one roof over our head when we get married. Okay, the same thing here. That's the vision. That God comes and resides with us here. And this, this intimacy with God, it grows and becomes this new dimension like we've never experienced before. A new dimension that hasn't been since the days before the fall, when God walked with man on the face of the earth. Are, are you kind of catching it? And so it's, it's about renewal and scholars disagree a little bit on, okay, is this replacement or is this renew? I'll just tell you right off the bat, I'm on the renew side. 
And the reason why I'm on the renew side is because, and as I understand it, the new creation, the new creation is like the resurrection of Jesus. And with the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus did not get a replacement body to where the first body was discarded and left in the tomb. No, it's the body that was crucified and put to rest in the tomb. That's the body that was resurrected. The tomb is empty. That's the body that was renewed. That's the body that was made new. And the new was actually superior to the old. And see, that's what I think God is up to. It's not about wiping away and replacing this earth, this creation. It's about the same type of thing that God did with Jesus. Renewing and even making superior to the original. God's not really about replacement. God's about renewal. God's not looking to replace me. God's looking to renew me. And that needs to be how we kind of see each other. That God's not looking to replace anybody. God's looking to renew us. And we live in a, we live in a time of replacement. Like the Lakers lost and they're already trying to figure out who do we replace. You know, I mean, it's the night of their defeat and they're not even waiting till the next day to have those conversations. Who do we replace? That's not how God thinks. That's not how God works. God is about renewal. And so he wants to renew each of our lives. He wants to renew our relationships and these bodies he promises one day will be renewed. And this creation, heaven and earth, not replaced, in God's time, renewed. And God won't just live up in heaven. No, God's moving in. Jerusalem coming down. And God dwelling in our midst. Listen to it again. Now the dwelling of God is with men. And he will live with them. They will be his people's. And God himself will be with them and be their God. Feel that communion. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Isaiah saw this day coming. He saw death being swallowed up. He saw every tear wiped dry. John's receiving the news, seeing it played out. Verse five, he was seated on the throne, said, I am making everything new, all things new. He th then he said, notice it's not I'm making all new things. It's I'm making all things new. I'm making all things new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. You can bank on it. He said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. You know, God's at the beginning of it. God's at the end of it. God's the one who sees it through from beginning to end. It's good to remember it didn't start with someone else. It starts with God. And it's good to remember it's not going to end with someone else or something else. Is going to end with God. That God is from beginning to end and God is over the whole thing. And you know what they were tempted to think? Maybe it started with God, but it sure looks like it's going to end with Domitian. No. It ends with God. It's for God. It's unto God. It's not Domitian's world. And we need a fresh reminder. God is the beginning. God is the end. It's God's creation. And God is the one who will renew, Amen. make all things new. Amen. Last thing. The one who overcomes, remember the one who is faithful, the one who doesn't compromise. What's that victory going to accomplish? You inherit all this. 
You have a part in the new creation. You have a place in the new creation. You have this life in the new creation. And even more, you hear God call you son. And that son language is kind of significant language. It means the inheritance is yours. In their culture, in their time, right or wrong, the inheritance went to the sons. And so by this son language, what's being said is that every person that stays faithful and true, male or female, son, the inheritance is for you. You have your share in the new creation. You belong as family. Then there's a warning. Verse 8. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur, This is the second death. Notice especially cowardly and unbelieving. The first two. Hear the context. Afraid of Rome. Compromise. Instead of staying faithful. Notice the last one. Liars. I think of Peter saying he didn't know Jesus. Deny. See, there's no place for that in God's kingdom. And everything in between, it has something to do with denying Christ as Lord and Savior. And so if you deny Christ here, you'll be denied life there. And it's not to say that we have to have lived perfect lives, no. We confess our cowardice. And we confess that, Lord, unless you strengthen me, I know I'm going to fall, and I know I'm going to give in, and I know I'm going to end up lying on you. Lord, by your grace, by your spirit, empower me to live faithful and true, to overcome. And he wants us to pray that. He wants to give us his spirit, his strength, so that we can be overcomers of the temptations, the pressures, to compromise. Our names are in his book of life because of what he has done for us. So I'm just thinking, AD 95, how is this going to hit me? I think it's going to shake me up. I need to be less worried about Rome and more focused on God. And I need to be less worried about what I might lose and more focused on the one who actually renews me. And I I think maybe it speaks that way today still. When I think, how does it hit me today, 2024? Kind of the same way. That I need to be less concerned about others judging me. You know, whether it's, you know, you know, government or corporation or place I work or neighborhood. I need to be less concerned about others judging me and what they might do to me and more concerned about the throne above, knowing that I'm guilty, but by the grace of God, my name's in the book of life as well. And I need to live my life towards that judge rather than towards all the judges just waiting to judge me. And then it also makes me kind of think, again, hits me the same way in terms of, wait a minute, my God's focused on renewal. My God has promised to renew me and to renew this creation. So rather than being so hung up on what I might lose or what thing, what I'm, you know, how costly it might be, to live towards the God that renews and to realize that even death is going to be done and I have the hope of resurrection and this inheritance of life. That's how it's hitting me. I I hope it's hitting you something similar. And 
I hear those words in terms of the cowardly and liars and yeah, those are the things that are in those old books. But John talks about, Jesus spoke about, we can start receiving that eternal life now. And we can know now that our names are in the book of life. And we can receive his spirit to empower us to live faithful and true to him rather than living those old ways of cowardice and lying and compromising, depending on who's in front of us. We take communion every week as a way to invite Jesus to strengthen us to be faithful. We confess, Lord, apart from you, I don't have the strength to stay faithful and true. Apart from you, I don't have the ability to live victoriously. And so we come every week for communion, receiving Jesus, receiving fresh strength, energy, motivation, love to stay faithful and true through the week. And so I want to take a moment and pray. And then I invite you to come and receive communion. Receive Christ afresh, his grace afresh, his strength afresh, that we might not be deceived in living towards the wrong throne, but to recognize, no, it's the throne above. It's Jesus who is worthy of our lives. So would you bow your heads and would you pray with me? Lord, I know that you are at work moving in our midst. And I know that you're moving each person to pray in particular ways. Lord, for those you're moving to confess their sins for the first time, to surrender to you for the first time, just pray, Lord, that you would give them the, the grace to do that to just pray, Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, come into my heart. Jesus, you are the Lord of my life. Jesus, I need you. And Jesus, give me strength to change and to follow you and to receive you and to be more concerned about you and less concerned about all those around me, what they might judge me for, how they might threaten me. And Jesus, you are the one and my life is for you. And Lord, whoever needs to pray that prayer, just give them the grace, the words to pray that prayer. And may they hear you speaking to them that yes, I receive you. I've covered you with my death, with my grace. Your name today is written in the book of life. Let them hear that assurance, Lord, through your spirit. And then Lord, you might be talking to others who haven't done so well living true to you. Help us, Lord, we pray. We get seduced, we get coerced, we get pressured. Lord, have mercy afresh upon us today. Cleanse us, purify us, restore us, and empower us, Lord, to live faithful and true to you at all costs. Lord, we wanna be a people that is marked by your presence in our midst when we're together and when we're alone. When we're gathered up here in church, when we're out there in the world, may we be marked by you. And it's evident to all that we belong to you by your presence and by the power that you give us to live faithful and true to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I invite you to stand and to come receive communion. And it's the body, it's the blood of Jesus given for us that our names might be written in the book of life. And as we receive him, it's fresh assurance that our names are there. And so Vonda, Sister Alex, would you come? Would you lead us? And there's a new name written down in glory. And I invite you to come and receive. And once everybody has received, then we will take communion together.
I was once a sinner, but I came pardon to receive from my Lord. This was freely given, and I found that He always kept His word. Oh, there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. And the white-robed angels tell the story. A sinner has come home. There's a new name written down in glory. And it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. With my sins forgiven, I am bound. Humbly kneeling at the cross, fearing not a sacred crown. When the heavens opened and I saw that my name was written down, oh, there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh, yes, it's mine. Sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven, evermore to roam. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. And the white-robed angels tell the story. betrayed, he was gathered in the upper room with his disciples celebrating the Passover meal. And when Jesus had taken the bread, he gave thanks and broke it and said, take and eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Amen. And then in like manner, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, take and drink, this is my blood, which is poured out for you, for the forgiveness of sin. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that I say. Yeah. 